semester. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, before introducing the speaker today, I'd like to tell you about the events this week and next week. On Friday, there is no lunchtime talk, but there we, we have the third lecture of the annual lecture series given at 3.30 p.m. by Matt Heber from the University of Utah, who will be talking about the species problem problem and the no solution solution. And on Tuesday next week, center fellow Nick Fion will be talking about the cogency of arguments involving approximations, again, at uh, noon. Um, and on Thursday next week, we have the next episode of the Cognitive Ontology Seminar. Instead of Monday, the next episode will be on Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. And we have two speakers, um, Brian Bruya and Julia Ass. Again, if you're interested in any of these events, uh, annual lecture talk on Friday, the lunchtime talk on Tuesday next week, or the next episode of the Cognitive Ontology Seminar on Thursday next week, please go to the website, check the calendar of the Center for Philosophy of Science, and you'll find links to register to any of these Zoom events. Today, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, Ed Slovik, who is a professor at the Winona State University. And uh, is, we are very lucky to have him as a, a center fellow this semester and uh, has uh, a long connection with the center. He's been a, a fellow of the center in, in the past. And we were delighted to uh, have him again as a center we wish in better circumstances. But it's been actually wonderful to uh, be able to interact with him nonetheless, uh, for um, uh, now already two months. Um, Ed uh, got his uh, PhD uh, from the Hawaii State University, and yet another connection to Pete, because his advisor was, uh, as, I, as I found out, Mark Wilson, uh, uh, my uh, colleague from the Department of Philosophy here at, at Pitt. Ed works on a, a range of questions in history and philosophy of science, including 20th century and anti philosophy of science, uh, uh, but has done most of his work on early modern philosophy with uh, a very well known focus on uh, space and time. But he's got much broader uh, areas of interest and competences, including um, uh, metaphysics, epistemology, and analytic philosophy. Um, his most recent book is called The Deep Metaphysics of Space, an alternative history and ontology beyond substantivalism and relationalism, published in 2016, uh, which you can find uh, online since there. And it's published in all the important journals in the history of philosophy, with, as I said earlier, a focus on early modern philosophy, often uh, Descartes, Hobbes, Kant, Leibniz, um, and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, really a very broad domain of expertise in this area. But today, Ed is going to be talking about uh, Kant and Marth, a note on Kant, as precursor of Marth, we're considering Kant's metaphysical foundation of natural science from a Huygensian frame. <laughs> I did my best to get this one right. <laughs> Ed, the floor is, is yours. Uh, Thanks so much, Edward. Uh, um, great to give a talk on this topic. Yeah, this, the title of this talk is, is quite a mouthful, a lot of different things. And I, I don't have a lot really to say on Mach. The, the name of the title is, is an allusion to, to a, um, a famous article that Popper published in the, uh, in the 1950s uh, called A Note on Berkeley as a Precursor of Mach. And, um, and a lot of the, the claims that Popper made there really apply to Kant as well. Um, part of, part of the, um, the, the reason I'm giving this paper, I, when I last visited the center in 2017, I gave a talk and I presented some of the ideas from my 2016 book on, on the ontology of space, you know, whether it's in the, in the early modern period, on whether it's monads or God or something else. And, and, and I wanted to give, um, and this was the other one I was thinking of giving, because this one is more uh, dealing with standard kind of conceptions of absolute and relational spaces applied to say mechanics. Uh, and not so much worrying about you know the ontology of it, and so I thought this is an uh, an interesting question, and also it's a response to my good friend Rob DeSalle, who's taken a quite a different position on on, on Kant's relationship uh, uh, to Newton in particular than I will give in this talk here. Uh, 
So, um, oh, okay, let me see if I can get going. All right. Okay, yeah, now I got it. Um, okay, so uh, moving along, um, rough definition of absolute and relational motion, right? That's one of the, the areas that I, I've mostly worked on and I'm interested in. Relationism holds that space and motion are mere relations amongst bodies uh, and that all motion then can only be relative to bodies, uh, not absolute space. And absolutism holds the opposite, right? Uh, that space is an entity independent of bodies and motions can be determined relative to space. Um, as I as, as I was briefly was mentioning, and I think I suggest a little bit myself, I've been working on the absolute relational debate. You know, how did it come about in the early modern period, or at least evolved at that point, and uh, and how should we think of it today? It's and um, and uh, and in what do Newton and Leibniz's respective spatial ontology? How do they differ from the the standard dichotomy of absolute relationism? Is, is some of the stuff I've published on in the book and 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 and, and since then. Uh, and how did the, the standard dichotomy of absolute relationism evolve in the 18th and 19th centuries? Uh, this presentation will explore relations themes in the work of Huygens, Barclay, and Kant that influenced the development of absolute and relational concepts. Uh, and so my proposal here, uh, and, and once again, this is contrasting with my, with my friends Rob and, and Michael, in contrast to the Friedman de Salle interpretation of Kant that emphasizes a Newton-Euler-Kant lineage, I, I think the better way to go is to see um, Kant as coming out of a Huygens, Leibniz, and maybe even Barclay Wolf lineage is more viable interpretation. And this is not meant to downplay the importance of Newton and Euler's work on Kant. You know, it's very, it's very substantial. Rather, it's simply this case that Kant's views fit the conception of the uh, of the Leibniz Wolf school uh, much better than it does sort of the Newton um, uh, um, uh, Euler lineage. Um, and and uh, my good friends um, uh, Marius Stan. And other people like Garrett Watkins have written on the uh, the influence on Kant from coming from the Leibniz, Leibniz Wolf School. So this is something that you know, many other people are doing really good work on over the last ten or fifteen years. And so my own contribution is I wanted I wanted to show how the absolute relational debate plays out with respect to something which I know you're all big fans of, and I am. That being the center of mass reference frame, <laughs> you know, something that I worked on in my earlier years. And so in many ways, this is kind of coming back uh, uh, to an old favorite of mine. Uh, and how the center of mass frame uh, played out uh, plays out in terms of relationism. Um, so one of the claims I can make here is one can trace a distinct relationist themes in the work of Huygens, Barclay, and Kant. Uh, Huygens, Barclay, and Kant accept the mechanics based on relational motion. Uh, Barclay and Kant accept spatial idealism, but it takes different forms for the two. Barclay in the critical period, Kant reject the type of God-grounded uh, God ontology of space accepted by Newton and Leibniz. Uh, the last time I was at the center, that last that third bullet point was the stuff I mainly talked about. Okay, so let's go to Huygens. Um, Huygens is fascinating because in many ways, I think the modern relational debate is due to him, uh, much more so than Descartes. Uh, the theological foundations of space is not a factor or only plays a minimal role. Uh, that is, Huygens' work seems to be closer in the spirit to Galileo. He really wasn't interested in this sort of these, you know, what, whether space is grounded on God or anything like this. He was really more in a, related to empirical notions of science. Um, but he did take up an interest in relational motion, which he seemed to have gotten from, from Descartes, um, although that's a, a long story in itself. And in particular, the things that I really came to, when I was doing the research for the book in 2016, it really, I, I really found a, a treasure trove of stuff, a lot of it out there you know, in, in, in other people's work over the centuries, about how Huygens really influenced the development of the absolute relational debate. And it, and it came due to the work he did on bodily collisions in the 1652 to 1656 period. And, and his work, which was known by many other uh, people uh, uh, doing physics at the same time, was a catalyst for the development of their ideas. And Huygens kind of got ticked because he felt that they weren't, they weren't um, um, acknowledging that they got the ideas from him. They were just kind of taking it and running off. Um, the big problem for Huygens is the problem of Cartesian physics and relational motion. Descartes seems to suggest that motion is relational. He thinks it's a reciprocal transfer of a body from its contiguous neighborhoods. I don't think he really was putting forward relational motion per se. I think uh, uh, his main argument was that motion is not a property inherited by bodies from other bodies and, and, and relational motion kind of falls out of that main goal. But that, you know, once again, that's a different story. But anyways, uh, the problem with Descartes' uh, collision rules is they don't uphold relational motion, which he supposedly upholds as well, right? And, and so he has a smaller body hitting a bigger body and the smaller body will rebound, but then uh, a bigger body hitting by a smaller body um, um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, um, 
maybe I'm going the exact right. small body hits a bigger body and rebounds a big body hits a small body and they move together from a relational perspective that's inconsistent because in relational motion there's only a, a, a difference there's only a relation amongst the bodies and so so in, in in essence a small body hitting a larger body right there's only really one type of collision there and if you treat it differently ascribing um, motion to the big body or to the little body, you're going outside of relational motion. Relational motion can't as assign individual speeds to bodies, only relative speeds. And so this was seen right away by Huygens and others as somewhat is, is inconsistent, right? If you're going to uphold relational motion, you can't treat these, these, these collisions as different uh, altogether. They have to be treated the same. So how did Huygens resolve this problem? Well, he introduced the center of mass reference frame to resolve this problem. Um, from the perspective of an observer situated at the origin of the center of mass reference frame, two non-accelerating bodies that approach one another from opposite directions along a straight line, irrespective of their size and speed, will rebound after the collision while retaining their initial speeds, or more formally, the center of mass frame is the point where the ratio of their speeds is reciprocal to the ratio of their sizes. And what Huygens was able to show is that the one collision rule that Descartes gave out of the list of seven that seems to make sense, that bodies, two, two equally sized bodies come together, they, they hit and then they rebound going backwards. He took that as a model to reconstruct all the collision rules of Descartes using the center of mass frame. I mean, it was really a, 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 really a brilliant achievement. In, 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 and some people have argued that in many ways, this is like one of the first sort of um, transformation concept, conceptions of how these different models can be transferred into, into, into one sort of more general one. Um, so anyways, here's Huygens himself stating this. Um, this is from um, uh, 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 work that um, is kind of a collection of a lot of his sayings uh, through his career on, on, on space and motion, this Codex 7a. After having shown that the speed of rebound or separation of two elastic or hard bodies um, depends on the relative speed with which they collide, I shall postulate there are perfectly elastic bodies that rebound with the same speed in which, uh, uh, with which they approach one another. From this I demonstrate that when they come into collision with velocities inversely proportional to their weights or quantities of matter that is size, they will each rebound with the same speed they had before. Um, Huygens proved that the center of mass reference frame provided a way of preserving Descartes' first collision rule and his analysis of motion as reciprocal transfer. Um, and, and like I said, he, he saw this as a, as, 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 a, as a kind of a brilliant achievement on it, which it is. Uh, Huygens' coupling of relative motion to a set of collision rules seems to have been the catalyst for many natural philosophers of the period, uh, uh, and not just Newton, to introduce an absolute relational dichotomy into their work, probably even more so than Descartes' own account of body, uh, uh, bodily motion as reciprocal transfer. So one of the things I found most fascinating about this, about some of the research I did, was finding guys like Borelli and stuff who basically accept an absolute relational distinction long before the Principia, uh, appears. So this is from, um, from, from this work of Borelli that appeared in 1667. And by the way, Newton knew a lot of these people and actually had correspondences with them. So my take on it is Newton clearly got the idea for absolute an absolute relational distinction from this work being done on the continent by these people who were influenced by Huygens. So here you have Borelli saying, in addition, local motion occurs either from one place of world space to another or in the relative space of some container. The former shall be called real and physical motion. The latter we will call relative motion, something oftentimes it does not involve, uh, although sometimes it does not involve a change of region. Um, what, what guys like Borelli and Pardis and others picked up on was a way to criticize Descartes by saying Descartes only gave his collision rules in relative space. He didn't give it in against absolute space. And so Descartes account of motion is really inconsistent. I mean, essentially they're picking holes in it saying, ah, your account of motion Descartes really only works in this limited way uh, of bodies relative to one another. It's not really telling you which is the actual bodies moving. And they, th they all thought they had kind of a brilliant a way to, 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 to cut down Descartes. And of course, at this time in the 1660s, Descartes fame, right? And his influence is, is, is incredible, especially on the continent. Um, so here's Pardis from a work from 1670 as well. I call absolute velocity that which is considered um, a body compared with the space wherein it moveth and, and respective or relative that which is considered in two bodies compared together by which velocity these two bodies mutually approach. So there's Pardis using the same absolute relational distinction. Um, Pardis specifically criticizes the Cartesian conservation law that quantity of motion, size, time, speed is conserved by impact, claiming, and here's one of Pardis direct criticisms at Descartes. It is not true that there is always as much absolute motion after the percussion 
as there was before, but it is easy to demonstrate that the respective motion is always the same, so that the bodies recede one another after the percussion as fast as they approach before it. So here's, you know, essentially saying Descartes, you know, you, you kind of goofed, right? You're only talking, your account of motion only works in this limited way and, and with respect to other bodies, it doesn't really tell you what, which body's really moving, right? Relative to the absolute space or, or you know, the, the world space or whatever they want to call it. Um, Huygens thought that these guys were making a mistake because Huygens was clearly in the relational motion camp and the very fact that they were making a distinction between absolute and relational motion he found problematic. And he says uh, to, in, in his writings here, I claim that motion is nothing unless in relation to other bodies without any offense to God. We shall say that he cannot make it thus that there is a relation to something that does not exist, i.e. that a body be several bodies. Similarly, I maintain that God also cannot create a single body at rest for rest, just as motion is relative to something. So Huygens buys into relational motion, uh, even if these other people didn't, or maybe even if Descartes wasn't necessarily a, a full relationist. And, and here's a, a bigger statement, um, uh, rejecting this conception of absolute space, which is popping up in Borellian parties and, and, and Decolle and many other people who are working on this. Absolutists accept that absolute space is truly unmoved. We who call Copernicus position will say that it is perhaps the fixed stars in the center of the sun that are truly at rest. Now they are at any rate relatively at rest, each one relative to the other. But since they are placed in the space of the world, infinitely extended on all sides, then with respect to what bodies or what other things are they altogether at rest? With respect to the unmoved space of the world, they will, they, they will reply. Thus the entire question turns on this point, namely, if the infinitely extended space of the world is unmoved, to me, however, this seems like a false notion. So he wants to reject this idea that you know you can peel to something outside of motion being just relational to bodies. Um, Huygens concludes that motion and rest can only be determined with respect to other bodies, as I was just mentioning. And so if you're really gonna pick anybody in the history uh, of science who really stands out as the first truly modern relationist who makes these, these, these provocative statements that if a body was all alone, it could not move, it would be Huygens. It's not Descartes. Descartes never made a claim. That if there was only one body in the motion, that that it could that it that it's impossible for it to move, and neither did Leibniz either. Um, so the first really truly committed relationists that we that in the modern period we can say was Huygens. Um, God does not appear to play any role in this system, unlike it does for God uh, for Leibniz and and even Descartes and stuff. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to get into Berkeley here. Um, Berkeley uh, follows the Huygens prince uh, um, uh, a precedent there. Um, and so, in his, one of his very first, one of his very first works, *The Principles of Human Knowledge*, you get stuff like this. I'm, I must confess, it does not appear to me that there can be any motion other than relative, and on and on and on. Let me, let me, like I said, Berkeley is just kind of a, a fit in here, <laughs> mainly to to make the the connection to Popper and the title of the paper. But but Berkeley would be a person, you know, following in the footsteps of Huygens. Um, it follows from his idealism. I'm going to skip this one here. Um, but his idealism undermines absolute motion and absolute space. I believe we may find that all absolute motion we can frame an idea uh, uh, of to be at bottom no other than relative motion thus defined. From what has been said, it follows that the philosophical considerations of motion does not imply the being of an absolute space, right? So, so just like Huygens. Um, turning the cot now, the main guy we're, we're, we're gonna be interested in here. In Kant's pre-critical period, he follows basically Huygens and Leibniz, I mean, uh, Huygens and, well, Leibniz too, but Huygens and, and Berkeley's conception of motion that we were just looking at. In the pre-critical period, um, roughly from 1747 to the mid 1660s, Kant put forward a monadic conception of the material world following the leibniz wolf School. This is the paper I talked about three years ago, um, where force is the basis of all material phenomena, although he rejected any idealist phenomenalist worldview, uh, such as Berkeley, uh, where all that exists are minds. Um, from the late 1660s though, Kant, uh, Kant's critical period work begins to question the Leibniz-Wolf conception uh, uh, in various degrees. It doesn't necessarily overthrow it, but, but he's becoming more critical of relationism. Um, the Newtonian theory of gravity is a central component of Kant's critical period work. So now here's where I bring in the work of, of Michael and, and, and Rob. Um, did Newton's work prompt the transition to Kant's critical period? Um, like I said, this is kind of a, one of the main threads here or Newton and Euler's criticisms of relational motion. How important is the role of Newtonian science in general to Kant's work? Uh, Michael I, doesn't go nearly as far as Rob. Uh, Michael's quite right, and he says here, my reading of Kant's treatise is Newtonian, insofar as I place Newton's principle at the very foundation. 
I think that's true to a certain extent, but New is it Newton as understood through the absolute space theorists, or is it understood through the Euler, uh, the the um, the um, Leibniz Wolf school? Right. Um, and but it's it's Rob who gives a much more full throated view that no, it's that that Kant's critical period work and and his work in the um, in the in, in the in, in the work or, or the National Foundations uh, uh, the, the work we'll be getting to shortly, he wants to say that it's really Newtonian. And it's a really overthrow of the absolute relational debate. So, so Rob says, Kant's mature concern was not to establish one of two opposing metaphysical positions, absolutism versus relationism, but to demonstrate that the metaphysical concept that occurs in physics, body, force, motion, space, time, become intelligible to us precisely and only as they are constructed by physics itself. Physics provides us with the only intelligible notion, notions we have on these matters. Therefore, the metaphysical concepts underlying the sensible world first become intelligible for Kant in the framework of Newtonian physics. So, so Rob DeSalle really sees that Newtonian physics is the catalyst for Kant's later work um, in the critical period that relates to space and motion. Um, and and, and in other words, it kind of like, it's kind of like it, Newton woke him from his dogmatic slumber about relationism or something like this. So DeSalle, Kant's analysis of absolute space accordingly is an effort to clarify its place within the system of Newtonian principles. Um, now, Clearly, Newtonian physics is central to the metaphysical foundations, the, the work we're going to be getting to shortly. But is it due to one, the established status that Newtonian theory had obtained by Kant's later years? Here, you know, here we're talking the 1760s, and Newtonian science is, 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 is just massively successful, right? In fact, some of the, the great predictions by Clairaut and stuff of the return of Halley's Comet, Halley's Comet had already occurred, and everybody is now getting on the Newtonian bandwagon. By the 1760s and 70s, Newton's theory is, is decisively victorious over the Cartesian vortex theory. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of, you know, I can, for anybody who, who might have been skeptical of Newtonianism, right, this was a time period where you're, you're starting to move in, in the Newtonian direction. Um, so is it Newton's success or is it two? For Kant, Newtonian physics is in itself a philosophical critique of metaphysics as traditionally practiced, as Rob wants to argue. I think it's clearly one and not two. Uh, on the evidence from the text, my proposal is the many non-Newtonian features in Kant's theory and the fact that much of the pre-critical conception of motion is retained in the crit critical period. Option one appears to be the more plausible interpretation. That is, Kant remained loyal to the Leibniz-Wolf tradition and in fact tried to assimilate Newtonian uh, theory to that tradition. Not that it was, you know, Newton came along and, whoa, I have to rethink my whole uh, conception of motion the way the Leibnizians and the Wolfians had taught me in my earlier years. Because Kant started off as a, it was one of the greatest of the Leibniz Wolf followers in his, in his early pre critical work. Um, and in the early pre critical work, in a work um, towards the end of that period, the new doctrine of motion and rest, he really puts forward a conception of motion that follows Huygens and Barclay, alongside the same uh, limited relations conception of place and motion that one finds in Huygens and Barclay, uh, is, is what you get uh, with Kant in this work. Before introducing the, his impact model, he argues that the place of a thing is known by its position, situation, or by its external relationship to other objects around it, which he dubs a relative space. And he insists that the terms motion and rest should never be used in an absolute sense. So in the pre-critical period, he's clearly on board with the Huygens, Barclay, and I guess you could say Leibniz school of relational motion. Um, now let's turn to the, uh, the, the, the work that's in, in the title of the paper, The Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science his most uh, important work on motion and all in, in physics and stuff in the critical period from 1786. So, um, you know, sort of right at, in, at the time he was writing the critique and, and the second version of it. Uh, all motion that is an object of experience is merely, and so he, the, his, his um, relationism that he accepted in the new doctrines of motion from the 1750s is retained here in this work. All motion that is an object of experience is merely relative and the space in which it's perceived is a relative space, which itself moves in turn in an enlarged space. To assume an absolute space that is one such that uh, because it is not material, it can also not be an object of experience as given in itself, is to assume something which can perceive neither in itself nor its consequences. You're getting a little of the critique ease language there, right? That it, it, it's not an object of experience in, in, you know, in, that, in, that, in that kind of uh, line. Um, but he's still holding on to relational motion in rejecting absolute space. But Kant is very clever. He redefines absolute space. I mean, and this is one of the things that's really interesting about Kant is that 
and maybe this shows you the Newtonian influence, right? That absolute space seemed to be something that a lot of people are gravitating to, no, no pun intended. And he wants to hold on to that term, but he gives it a relationist interpretation. So here you get some of this. Absolute space is therefore necessary, not as a concept of an actual object, but rather as an idea, which is to serve as a rule for considering all motion there and merely as relative. So, I mean, that, that, you know, that is really, I mean, it's kind of pulling an underhanded maneuver there, I guess, you know, you could say um, that he's defining absolute space merely as essentially relative motion and all motion and rest must uh, be reduced to absolute space if the appearance therefore is to be transformed into a determinate content of experience. Um, there's certain metaphysical issues we could chat about in the in discussion because you could always say that that motion is always relative to something, whether it's bodies or absolute space, but he wants it to be relative to other bodies or to the center of mass frame, and that which is a material frame, and so that would that would cut against any kind of absolutism. Um, and so going on here, in all experience, something must be sensed, and that is the real uh, of sensible intuition. And therefore, the space in which we are to arrange our experience of motion must also be sensible. That is, it must be designed through uh, through what can be sensed. Uh, this is very much like what Leibniz uh, says in, in, in the Leibniz Kart correspondence in some ways. And this, as the totality of all objects experience in itself, an object of experience is called empirical space. But this as material is itself movable. But a movable space, if its motion is capable of being perceived, presupposes in turn an enlarged material space, which it is movable and so on into infinity. So one of the things he tries to do in the, in the metaphysical foundations is to show that you can always talk about motion with respect to other bodies or a center of mass frame. And, and and if you want to include other bodies, then you're just going to you're just going to make the, the the totality of bodies bigger, and so you're always measuring motion with respect to the rest of the bodies in the world in some way, shape, or form, and that's clearly relational. Um, one of Kant's main objectives, and this is where I bring it, uh, we get back into um, the discussion of Huygens, is his way of treating gravitation as essentially an instance of collisions in the center of mass frame, but not collisions where bodies come together and they hit and they rebound, but essentially two bodies in equilibrium that have a gravitational attraction between one another. So it's more or less the same scenario, but rather than a collision, it's the gravitational attraction between the two. Uh, one of Kant's main objectives in the mathematical foundations is to supply his own interpretation of Newtonian gravitation theory, a process that concludes by considering the cosmos as a whole together with the common center of gravity of all matter is the ultimate relative space for correctly determining all true motion and rest. This is Michael's uh, description of it in his, in his um, introduction to the metaphysical foundations from 2004. Uh, and of course, Mach does the same thing. Um, in fact, the center of mass frame, right, is in many ways still the default view for people who want to develop a relationist conception of, of mechanics and maybe even gravitation theory um, that you get in, say, Bar uh, Barber and Bertotti, um, basically still doing the same thing of using the center of mass frame to, in some sense, provide a relationally palatable uh, description of Newtonian mechanics. Um, anyways, going on here. One of the novel features of Kant's system is that he envisions the center of mass approach as an instance of a larger strategy for interpreting all bodily interactions that also include within its scope the center of mass frame collision model first pioneered by Huygens. As regards impact, um, Kant provides an example involving two bodies A and B that approach uh, from opposite directions along the same rectilinear path collide and reverse their motion. So this is straight Huygens, um, uh, uh, the Huygens conception, uh, which, which um, Kant, you know, did in the, in, the, in the new doctrine of motion, and he holds over here in the metaphysical foundations. Uh, the change of relation is completely mutual, so much as that one body approaches every part. I, I'm going to skip a little bit in this, so we don't have to go through the whole thing. On this basis, the motion of body A with respect to another body B at rest, in regard to which it can there be moving, is reduced to absolute space. Remember, absolute space is just a term for uh, um, a, a system of bodies moving relationally to one another in the center of mass frame, right? It's not real absolute space. That is as a relation of acting causes merely related to one another. And the only way that this can happen is that the speed ascribed in relative space to body A alone is a portion between A and B an inverse ratio to their masses. And so that's the Huygens principle for collisions. Um, after detailing his impact model, he comments that the communication of motion through impact differs from that through traction, gravitation, only in direction in which the matter uh, resists one another in their motions. So, you know, so basically he's assimilating gravitation 
to the collision model in the center of a mass frame as a way to do it. Now, of course, the center of mass frame is also important in Newtonian uh, 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 science, obviously, right? In Newtonian gravitation theory. But as I will say shortly, it's the lessons that 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 Kant draws from his use of the center of mass frame that puts him in the Huygens, Berkeley, Leibniz camp, not in the Newton camp. Uh, but anyways, Clint following up here, it follows then that in all communication motion, action and reaction are always equal to one another. It's uh, one, one of the other principles that, that Kant puts forward. Um, besides the replacement of, uh, so now how does this um, use of the center mass frame for gravity um, follow in the Huygens tradition? And, and that'll, this will be the next thing. Besides the replacement of absolute space with a material-based reference frame, the relationism inherent in Kant's metaphysical foundations appears in the following ways. One, the individual states of motion assigned to the bodies are perspectival, but the invariance of the relative change in distance among the bodies is emphasized. All motion of material things count as merely relative with respect to one another as alternatively mutual, but not as absolute motion or rest. So the first point, right, is that motion can only occur between bodies. Um, and so he's, he's upholding that conception. Uh, and just like Huygens and, um, and Barclay, uh, uh, he basically says if the body was all by itself, there's no way it could move because there's nothing else that it can move relative to. Two, Kant converts one of Newton's empirical arguments for absolute space via the rotating globe's thought experiment into a form that allegedly upholds relational motion among the material parts of the rotating system. This is really a unique thing that I don't think a lot of commentators have, have, have commented on. Uh, Newton's idea of the rotating uh, bucket that essentially showed that the uh, motion of the water relative to the sides of the bucket can't account for the inertial forces of the, of the, of the, of the water going up the sides. Um, that, that's the, the main knockdown argument against relationism always has been, right? Um, uh, but what does Kant do? He basically says, well, the, the manifestation of the, the of the water going up the sides of the bucket shows that it's rotating, so I can account for it, and so I, I don't have an empirical problem. It's you know, it's, it's essentially like he's basically saying um, I can account for uh, the the, the, the the rotating bucket by just appealing to the forces, and that shows me that the motion of the water was you know um, um, uh, uh, is it, essentially what he's saying here. And make a long story short, is that the motion is occurring relative to other bodies. Um, this would be a sort of a line that Mach would give. Um, and therefore, we can account for the uh, Newton's thought experiment without appealing to absolute space by just appealing to the motion being relative to other bodies. He doesn't give all the specifics of it, but he, he lays the, the seeds for that response. Circular motion, although it is in fact exhibits no change of place in the appearance, exhibits nonetheless a continual dynamical change demonstrable through experience and in the relation of matter within its relative space for example, a continual domination of attraction and virtue of striving to escape. So he's basically saying we can account for Newton's um, rotating buckets experiment, but we don't need to bring in absolute space. We can just say that it's, it's an experience we have and it must be relative to things that it's moving you know, relative to. So, so that line of strategy, uh, which you know, probably there were precedents before Kant, but, but Kant gives that uh, a big uh, emphasis too. Um, in fact, speaking of this, concerning the rotation of the earth, he says, this motion, even though it is no change of relation to an empirical space, is nevertheless not absolute motion, but rather a continuous change in the relations of matter to one another, which although represented in absolute space is thus actually only relative. And for just that reason is true motion. This rests on the representation of the mutual and continuous withdrawal of any part of the earth outside the axis from any other part lying diametrically opposite to it at the same distance from the center. And so he thinks that, you know, you know, by appealing to these inertial forces of the water going up the side of the bucket or whatever, we have a, a material, we have an experience that will in some sense reveal that the motion is, 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 ro is a rotational motion. But don't think that you need to appeal to absolute space to account for this. You can just appeal to the, the, either the center of mass frame or, or other bodies, you know, that, that would, would give you a framework for determining that motion. Um, and that's very relationalist, needless to say. Three, Kant rejects as utterly impossible a scenario wherein the entire cosmos moves uniformly and rectilinearly through space. Uh, what what came, to be, came to be known in, in, in the modern literature is the kinematic shift arguments, which appear in the leibniz clark correspondence. And likewise denies a potential cosmic rotation, but concedes that it is always possible to think of such a motion although to suppose it would be so far as one can see entirely without any use. So he, uh, he rejects uh, um, a kinematic shift, uh, the idea that the whole material universe could be moving through space. Um, and that's very relationist, needless to say. Um, for absolute motion, 
uh, thought without any relation of one matter to another is completely impossible. So there's another claim that you know, there's just no absolute motion. Um, so when you look at the at, when you look at all the details of the metaphysical foundations, this is clearly a, a, an important relationist conception of Newtonian science, or or, re, or you can say a, a reinterpretation of it. These relationist aspects of Kant's system and the mathematical foundations raise severe problems. And now let's go back to uh, Rob's interpretation for DeSalle's claim that Kant's mature concern um, was not to establish one of two opposing metaphysical positions, absolutism versus relationism, but to demonstrate that the metaphysical concepts that occur in physics, body, force, motion, space, time, become intelligible as precisely and only as they are constructed by Newtonian physics itself. Uh, physics provides us with the only intelligible notions we have on these matters. Um, and that, that was Rob's claim. Um, nevertheless, the evidence you know, in this presentation indicates that the non-Newtonian that non-Newtonian principles played uh, a role in Kant's system at least as important as the overall you know, gravitation theory of Newton, with his rejection of a uniform inertial motion of the material world presenting the most conspicuous example. Um, right? I mean, he rejects the idea that the whole universe could be moving through space. Um, in fact, uh, Kant says uh, to argue against that view. If a body were located outside the cosmos, that is outside, say, our solar system or whatever you consider to be the world, our world is, Kant reasons that the mutual gravitational interaction between the cosmos and this body would shift the common center of gravity of all matter and thus the entire cosmic system from its place, but then motion would already be relative. So basically saying that, um, that if there was a body outside the world, right, and we were talking about saying, uh, um, you know, being sub sub subject to to um, the gravitational attraction of, of, the, of the, the world itself, you know, the body relative to the world, that we can model this within the, the center of mass frame. But since we, you know, with, with the universe being on one side and the body on the other, but that would then fall within the context of his conception that motion always cur occurs within the center of mass frame and that the center of mass frame or the center of gravity frame, you can use either term or can be used here, that this would still uphold relative motion because it's within it's, its motion relative to this material sort of system, this material frame. Um, yet by stipulating a decidedly Newtonian concept of inertia, a uniform inertial mode, you know, so that was that was Kant's attempt to, to say that, you know, if you want to talk about bodies outside the world, fine, but it doesn't undermine my, my center of mass frame conception. And you can still see it as upholding, you know, my conception of absolute space or absolute motion, which of course is relationist. Um, but here's the problem, right? Um, because Kant does seem to accept an inertial principle in his physics. And so by stipulating a decidedly Newtonian concept of inertia, uh, a uniform inertial motion of the entire cosmos should be a possible state of affairs. Or put in specifically Newtonian terms, and in, in, in fact, Kant almost seems to be saying that this can't occur because it violates one of his laws for uh, action-reaction. Um, and so I, as I put it here, or put in specifically no Newtonian terms, Kant's hypothesis where only a gravitational interaction with an outside body can cause a rectilinear unit. In fact, and that actually, I'm sorry, that, that was um, one of the details I left out when I was talking about the body outside the body. Kant seems to say that, that the gravitational attraction of that other body on the universe would be the only way you could talk about a, a uniform inertial motion of the cosmos, right? But then of course it's within that, that, that center of mass frame. So um, anyways, going back to this criticism, um, uh, Kant's hypothesis where only a gravitational interaction with an outside body can cause a rectilinear unison motion of the cosmos is tantamount to claiming that the, new, that the world's inertial motion, which comes under Newton's first law of motion, would be sort of contradicting uh, Newton's third law of motion, which gives an action and reaction. It's almost like he's basically um, 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 subsuming as, as a special instance or as maybe a limited principle the, the inertial, uh, the first law of motion of Newton's as a subspecies of Newton's third law. That in, the, you know, in certain circumstances, uh, the conception of Newton's first law violates the third law and we can't have that. So the only way we can uphold these, uh, we, you know, the, the only way we can sort of uh, make sense of an inertial motion of the universe is if we see it within the context of Newton's third law. I mean, that seems to be like what he's saying. And so this is, uh, you know, so anyways, going on here, Kant's maneuver essentially constitutes a fundamental reconstruction of Newtonian physics, a reevaluation of basic principles that just so happens to fall in line with a Huygens style center of mass frame version of relationism. So, I mean, so that's a really radical claim that Kant was making in terms of 
you know, how to uphold his relationism in, in the center of mass frame. Um, and, and so it really seems like he's, he's sort of um, taking the Newtonian conceptions, the laws of motion and stuff, and interpreting it within a, within a framework that upholds relational motion. So um, going on here accordingly, while Newton undoubtedly played a significant role in Kant's mature natural philosophy, perhaps it would be more accurate to infer that, and this is against Rob, uh, for Kant, the metaphysical concepts underlying the sensible world first became intelligible in the framework of Huygens' Leibniz-Wolfian physics, not in terms of Newtonian physics, because that's, that's what Rob's claim was. Um, likewise, it is rather difficult to avoid the conclusion that one of the chief goals of the metaphysical foundations is to provide an anti-absolutist interpretation of Newtonian physics, uh, anti-absolutist in the sense of, of accepting uh, some kind of reference frame, which is not material, right? That's not bodies of the center of mass frame. Um, is to provide a, an anti-absolutist interpretation of Newtonian physics that follows the relationist precedent sent by such thinkers as Huygens and Berkeley, as well as Kant's own earlier work, The New Doctrine. Uh, if Kant's system is examined against the backdrop of the absolutist Newton-Euler conception versus um, the relationist Huygens, Leibniz, Berkeley, Wolf conception, his metaphysical philosophy and the metaphor metaphysical foundations uh, clearly favors the latter, right? If you're, if you're, if you're looking at the, New the Newton Euler conception, right, versus um, where, where um, in, in some sense, you know, inertial motion, right, is, is, is the cornerstone, right, uh, you could say of, of, of that approach, right, where the, the world can move uniformly, right, and there's no, there's no, um, there's no um, limitations on that. We just saw how uh, Kant wanted to try to limit that, right, in, in, in a way. Um, and so clearly he seems to be on the Huygens, Leibniz, Berkeley, Wolf side there. Um, and put simply here, um, Kant's non-trivial deviations from Newtonian orthodoxy undercuts the claim that he deems Newtonian physics to be a philosophical critique of metaphysics as traditionally practiced. Rather, the evidence points in the opposite direction. A relationist applied metaphysics serves as the basis of a philosophical critique of Newtonian physics as traditionally practiced. So I actually think that the opposite is true of what Rob was arguing, that basically he's, he doesn't, Kant didn't see Newtonian physics as, a, as, as something that challenged his views and that he had to reconsider um, 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 the, his, uh, his, his conception of motion in light of Newtonian science. No, he took Newtonian science and Newtonian gravitation theory and he developed it, a relationist account of it um, that fully fit his own earlier views from the new doctrines of motion. And so I, I, I really don't see this in the way that Rob does as kind of like a um, being awoke from your, your dogmatic slumber and now I'm seeing motion and physics differently. This is just an extenu uh, continuation of his own relationism from his earlier period, um, but it's more sophisticated. And the thing that's so, so, so interesting about it, right, is that you can really see a, a, a common thread from Huygens' um, uh, construction of the center of mass reference frame as a way to, to treat rela uh, relational motion within, within mechanics. And it develops onwards, right? And then you eventually get um, Kant trying to do the, uh, use the same thing to give a relationist interpretation of gravity. And then of course that continues on to Mach and Barber and Bertotti. I mean, there really is a common thread and Kant really stands at the center of place in this, in this development of modern relationist mechanics. He's the first guy that in some sense took the collision model of Huygens and gravity and tried to bring them together into one, one conception where all motion would be considered to be a, a version of action and reaction, whether it's collisions or gravity within the center of mass frame. So he's really important for the development of modern relationism, you know, you know, in, in modern relation, like I said, said really still in many ways is wedded to this conception in, in the, in the uh, work of Barbara and Bertotti. Oh, and that's it. So I guess it was a little shorter than I, so, oh, 45, that's not bad. I, <laughs> I thought it would go for at least another 10 minutes. So, um, but anyways, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Ed, for this uh, uh, really uh, entertaining talk. Uh, let me remind you how we're going to be proceeding for the Q&A. If you have a question, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button and just write your name uh, there. And I will promote you from the status of attendee to uh, the status of uh, panelist so that you can ask your question directly to, um, to Ed. So please go ahead uh, to the bottom of the screen and write your name for the question uh, you uh, might have. Uh, 
All right. Why people are um, uh, um, writing their name? I will um, start then. Um, and it's really a clarification question Ed, about um, some of the quotations you put, but give from 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 Kant. Um, you know, I'm far from being an expert, mm -hmm. and um, I I was wondering exactly. I, so Kant say, seems to say a few different things. On the one hand, it, seem, it seems to say um, that um, uh, an absolute space is impossible. At some point, you had a, a quotations where it seems to be saying that much. And, but he also seems to think that it's perfectly conceivable, but, of, uh, but conceiving of motion as taking place in an absolute space is conceivable, but, not, but of no use. Uh, yeah. In a sense, it does not, does not help us specifically account for the phenomena that we are observing. And so, somehow these two quotations, I mean, I, I don't want to say they're inconsistent, but they at least have a very different flavor to, 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 to me, right? Uh, yeah. while, while as almost a pragmatist, uh, feeling, you know, I have, I have a concept, I have a, 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 actually a, an, an ideal, as you rightly put it earlier, and I can use it to conceive of, of space, uh, absolute space, but that's not uh, uh, that's not useful for my physics. And the other one is much stronger claim about what's possible. So I was wondering exactly uh, how how things fit together for um, um, for Kant. Yeah, um, I, I think this might have been the one uh, the slide. I think you were you were thinking of. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one I had in mind. Yes, De dealing with rotational motion. It's really an interesting yeah. claim there. He, he, I think he seems to realize since the center of mass frame is a rota you know, rotating frame, you know, is, uh, in, in, in that sense, or kind of you know, allows for it. Um, he, he wasn't quite sure that he could necessarily reject it completely. But I mean, his line is really weird. He says, he, you know, that he says, it seems like you could, you could talk about a cosmic rotation, but he concedes it's always, it, you can think of such a thing, although, uh, um, although, to suppose it would, so far as one can say, be entirely without any conceivable use. Yeah, there is kind of an interesting tension here. Um, and, and of course, that gets to the heart of rotational motion, which is, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, that Newton's, Newton's rotating uh, um, uh, bucket experiment was always seen as the, as, as the challenge. Both Leibniz and, and even Huygens and others had thought that there has to be some kind of a way to deal with it. And, and, and he, you know, he dismisses the motion of the universe inertially in a straight line right through space but he kind of leaves it out here that you can think of this thing but it doesn't seem to have any useful purpose i think what he's trying to say maybe is that you know while you can conceive of it um you know it maybe the argument here is that there's no empirical aspects of it but that would seem to be problematic because he's appealing to the water riding up the sides of the bucket to to, to say that no oh, yeah that bucket's really rotating right there so is his argument then you know, I have to go back now and look at this, the specific details. I forget exactly his reason for doing this. Um, it, but, but yeah, I mean, in, 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 in short, uh, uh, Edward, yeah, there is kind of a weird tension here. He seems to be allowing that you can think about it, but maybe it's not actual. So it's a conceptual possibility, but not an actual possibility. Would he say that if the, the, the universe was rotating, we would see some effects of inertial forces on everybody, uh, or or maybe he says that you know you can't ever detect that. Um, uh, in many ways, I, I think this is kind of a leftover um, of the problem of rotation in general that that Newton's uh, um, uh, thought experiments had had brought up for Kant and for Leibniz, because um, there were many attempts to try to deal with a way to explain rotational motion that would be consistent with relationism, either by talking about inertially moving bodies that somehow get their motions turned around. Uh, um, and, 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 um, or that you can always think of this Leibniz's view was you could always think of, of the, um, the, the, the motion um, of the particles on the outer side of the body as getting into inertial collisions with the particles outside of the rotating body. And you could therefore frame, um, you, could, you can in some sense break down a rotating body into collisions and inertial frames. And of course, inertial frame collisions, right, as we saw through Huygens, was a way to uphold relationism. There was all these different ways to deal with it, but maybe this is kind of a leftover of those, of those uncertainties with how to resolve the rotational motion problem for relationism that, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they didn't have good answers, right? I guess would be the one way to say it, so. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Nick, uh, the screen is yours.
You should unmute yourself, Nick. Ah, yeah. Okay. I was going to say the screen's mine, but not the camera or the mic. So thanks. Thanks, Sid. Um, uh, very nice talk. I'm really glad I was able to kind of make this. Was, well, I'm glad you can make you know, it. Nick. Great. I was also going to say, you know, one of my great regrets of not making it to the center this, you know, everything that's happened and not being at the center together this year is, you know, the chance to meet with you and talk talk about this, exactly these things. I'm glad um, we got to it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, this was this was great and really kind of an education. Um, you know, I especially liked, you know, one thing I especially, not just Kant, but the, the passages you had from other people who were working yeah. on a absolute relative distinction that I didn't know about. That's very interesting. But I did want to talk about, it is the Kant that I wanted to talk, talk okay. about. Um, the passage you had where he talks about absolute space not being an entity, but being an idea <clears throat> or a rule. Um, so in the first place, that reminded me a little bit about some passages from Leibniz, again, about, you know, say from the co correspondence with Clark, where he, he, he gives a similar, something, what I thought was going to be a similar construction of um, space in relative terms and talks about that as being mm -hmm. an idea. Okay, but to kind of get to the actual um, question, um, how do you reconcile, so how, I mean, I, how would, how can you reconcile, so Kant thinking of, of absolute space as, you know, as being ideal, um, how at this period would, you know, is that reconciled with now bringing in metaphysical and physical considerations like the, you know, the, the third law of you know, Newton's third law, how is that, how, how can that play a role if the thing is ideal? I mean, I think yeah, maybe I, in the critical period, I have a sort of, you know, naive philosopher's picture of how Kant might address that, but I'm wondering how, how can metaphysics and physics bear on the ideal in this, at this stage? Yeah, um, and that's a really good question. I'm trying to find the, the thing there. I, I think um, to make, to, to, to uh, answer the first thing about an idea, um, and I'm sure Michael, you know, uh, Michael's, you know, great book on this, on, on the Metaphysical Foundations, um, would have a lot more insights on this. But I, I'm thinking that he probably, Kant's probably working with the idea that you get in the critical period of, of like a schemata or an idea for, in some sense, incorporating phenomena within like, within, with a concept, some kind of conceptual, you know, his own uh, um, um, uh, uh, categories of understanding. Right, that it almost seems like he's giving that interpretation. I'm forgetting all the details now on that, but um, like he says, it's not an object of experience, but it's kind of like a schemata for interpreting experiences within this. So in, in, in that aspect of the metaphysical foundations really does seem to be in line with the critical period, right? That we have these categories of understanding or these ways of applying concepts to experience, right? Uh, um, and, 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 and so, uh, uh, and so he, he wants to give that kind of, you know, his own version of idealism, right? Not Barclay's idealism, but his own kind of uh, uh, empirical idealism, whatever we call empirical realism uh, on that. And so I think that's part of that. Um, um, yeah, let me see if this other passage here uh, is not as a concept of an actual object, but rather as an idea, which is to serve as a rule for considering all motion therein merely as relative. So I really, that does seem to me to kind of play the, the critiques game, right? Of seeing it as a way. But how does it deal with the, the I, I think your other part of your, your question was how does it deal with the metaphysical issues of like what exists or um, if, if I'm getting that right, um, like how does it play in, uh, how would this be different maybe from his earlier work or how does it differ from the, the issues that Leibniz was concerned about with whether space was an entity or something like that? Um, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I wasn't sure, I, is, was that part of what you were saying, asking in the second part of the question? Uh, Nick? So, I see. I mean, because you know, in the, in the critical period, right, he doesn't want to talk about the noumenal world. So maybe he would think at this point that now that he's in the critical period to talk about whether space is really an entity or not, would be to talk about noumena, you know, the noumenal world, and we can only deal with the phenomenal world as we experience it. Um, like in the earlier, in his earlier stuff, um, when he was really a, a Leibnizian, uh, this is stuff I talked about last yeah. time. Center. Okay. It's much more. It's much more 
really ingrained in Leibniz's conception, right? Monads are not in, his own monads are not in space, but the interactions of them bring about body and space. And so you get that kind of emergentist picture, right, of space emerging from this non-spatial world of monads. Um, and it's it, just like you get that in Leibniz, it's even more strongly in, in the pre-critical work of Kant. That stuff all drops out, right, when he gets to the critical period. And one of the things I, I really want to go back to work on Kant is, is you know, some of this may come up in the Opus Posthumum where he talks about, about, about fields there and, and, and things like this. But, um, you know, the, uh, Kant giving a theory of matter, right, of what really is there, I mean, yeah, that was, that's, um, is one of the, you know, one of those like unleft things or, or, or conceptions of, 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 I guess you could say, the world at, 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 the, at the most essential level is something that, um, as you know, we don't get, and um, and that supposedly was something he maybe wanted to do at some point. I'm forgetting all the details of the history of this now, but um, in terms of actually talking about entities, he really doesn't. Um, you know, he had the critique um, uh, in that come. You know, the, he had those criticisms that came up at the end of the uh, uh, pre-critical work, and, and you get in the um, and you get in the prolegomena where he argues that. Um, that the uh, you know as, as you got as you well know the handedness problem right that 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 space uh, um, that op that certain objects like gloves or screws have a handedness right to have an orientation as he uses that as an argument against relationism but he also argues thinks that it undermines all sort of metaphysical conceptions of space and that and that and that the um, the incongruent counterparts argument sorry was re is really proves the ideality of space right um, and, um, and 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 so. I don't know, make a long story short, I, I don't know if he really he has anything more to specifically say about uh, so, deep metaphysical okay. issues. So I, I mean, this was the sort of thought that I have. I think it kind of comes up something like this. If So now looking now I have the past in front of me. Now I'm thinking of space as just an idea or a rule for considering or motion. Well, if that's all it is, why shouldn't I consider the universe as moving at a constant rate through The cosmos is moving at a constant rate through it. Yeah. It's just an idea. It's just a way of considering things. You know, what? How does how does the third Newton's third rule kind of get some bite to so you say no? You can't consider things that way. Is it because we're considering the things as relative, and then there, you know that there would then be a sort of problem because we'd be doing more than just considering them as relative? Is that the, is that the idea? So that's the concern. How does how do those arguments then have some bite? If it's just yeah, an I mean idea. Especially as I was just mentioning with Edward, where he basically saying you can, can think of a rotation, but it serves no useful purpose. Why doesn't he say the same thing about an inertial motion of the cosmos? Maybe that's a way to reframe it. Um, and I think maybe because he doesn't have an answer for the rotational motion problem, you know, I, I, all of them were trying to, to try to get a way to do that that would uphold relationism without you know, admitting in some sense. Um, some kind of inertial frame or so. But I, I think his, his main issue is his his his. Um, his goal is I want to use the center of mass frame to resolve these problems. And so if you're going to talk about an inertial motion of the world, it can only be if there's another body on the end and we can put it in the center of mass frame. But then of course, the motion of the cosmos and the motion of the body would be within the center of mass frame and that's relationism. So I, it almost seems like it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a strategy for him to resolve the problem, which of course came up so so uh, importantly in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, when Clark criticizes Leibniz, saying, you know, why why couldn't the motion the universe move move through the world, right? And and he's saying, well, I have a way to say, yeah, we we can talk about that, but it's still relative <laughs> because it's because the, because the motion is is being you know is is being uh, uh you know on the one side of the uh, of the frame is the universe the other side is the body and they're falling within the center mass frame but why he 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 wants to say we can't have an idea of that um yeah i'm not quite sure and, and let, you know like i said it's 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 um um what he means what what he meant in the in the rotating case that you can have an idea, but it doesn't serve any purpose. It's really it's it's a it's a difficult uh, difficult uh, uh, issue to crack. It's it's unclear um, why he's willing to make that concession there and not in the case of, of the uniform motion. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if that's if that's helping at all. Yeah, yeah, no, that that that, that that's good. Give me some thoughts. Okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maya, floor is yours. Hey, Maya. Hi, Ed, can you hear me? Yep. Great. 
Um, thanks so much for the talk. This was really fun. Um, yeah. Glad you could. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just raises so many, I think, really fascinating and subtle issues. Um, and so uh, there's there's a lot of the details that I don't think I was able to pick up, but I'm, I'm curious about maybe for more of a bird's eye perspective, um, if you could say a little bit more about um, the historical significance of the, the research you've done here. So, and, and maybe my question ends up being just an invitation for you to restate your thesis to like get at precisely what the, the takeaway is supposed to be. So, so what I've, I've gathered here is that you're um, at least in part disagreeing with Desai about the specific lineages that contribute to some of this work in Kant. Yeah. Um, contrasting the Newtonian lineage, lineage from the Huygens, Leibniz, Wolf one, um, and that's, you know, I think I think the textual evidence you brought to bear on that was pretty convincing, and it and it more of a sort of fits with what I think about, or little I know about um, Leibniz and and Wolf at least uh, influencing Kant. Um, But but it's obviously not that like uh, one of these lines of influence is accurate and the other is inaccurate or totally non-existent. Um, so so how do you either resolve that tension in the details? Like what what is the appropriate like line to carve around the Newtonian influence? Um, yeah, that would be consistent with your view. Does that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I was just saying, like, it, like you know, how did you know Newton's influence? You know, how does that factor into 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 Kant's work? And um, and and really, what is the? I, I guess you could say, how do you um, uh, resolve that? You know, issue while showing the importance still of Huygens and stuff. Um, and, and, and not just saying that it's just Newton, you know, uh, that, that that's everything to him. As you know, like I said, Rob, Rob's work is really interesting on this, but but the, the, the claim, like I said, I, that, that I, I found so problematic is that one towards the end, uh, I think that's the very last slide I have there, where, where, where Rob wanted to say that, um, that Newtonian physics was almost like something that got him to rethink all of his views about, about motion and bodies and that he it, it was the catalyst for a development of a whole new sort of program that that where, where Newtonian physics is really the central issue. And, and my take on that is that no, it's he's just doing the same stuff he was doing before it in the pre-critical period. Because you know, th those ideas I mentioned in the in, in that work, um, the new um, uh, new theory of motion, I'm forgetting the name of it now from uh, from uh, um, 1758 has more or less the same relation as conception of motion. It's just now he's giving a more sophisticated view of it um, that isn't just impact anymore in the center of mass frame. It's also gravity is incorporated in that, in, in that conception. Um, but also the, the thing that's interesting is that he's bringing in all those ideas from the critique about a, a schemata for the understanding for how we can construct in some sense uh, a frame that will uphold his conception of relational motion. Um, and and so I, um, you know, and I should mention too, by the way, that other scholars have talked about the relationism inherent in in the the uh, the new foundations. Um, and so you know, this is not something that that's new. Um, my main thread was my main thing was to show how, in particular, uh, you can really trace this line from Huygens and using the center of mass frame through Kant going forward. And that this is a long lineage of relationism that uses the center of mass frame as a way to model uh, um, essentially Newtonian mechanics in a relationally palatable way, and 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 to think therefore that it's that it's outside of that tradition, which is maybe what Rob was saying, or that that, that you know maybe Rob was thinking that, that that at this point Kant was kind of forsaking uh, his Leibnizian Wolfian heritage and all this stuff, uh, and and and, and clearly. He, in, 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 in this kind of maybe following up with the discussion with Nick and Edward, is that 
clearly he doesn't want to play the metaphysics game in the crit critical period, right? I mean, he, you know, um, it was Hume that woke, woke him up from his dogmatic slumber, not Newton, right? And and in 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 the um, the impact of the of the British empiricists really made him want to do, uh, you know, my take on it is he really wants to do metaphysics now within an empirical framework, um, and and so so I almost see the the influence of the the critical turn, right? His his own Copernican revolution. And um, as being as, as important to the content of the new foundations, this work that we've been look, investigating from 1786, uh, um, I see that as um, is just as crucial as, if not more so, than the influence of Newton. My own take on it, I think I mentioned that one slide, is by the 1760s, Newton was was just you know he had won the day. Um, um, I, I was mentioning the. Um, uh, the uh, uh, when Clairaut predicted the return of Halley's Comet like two years ahead of time, I think it was, and he gave like a four to six week period that when you know he made this prediction that you're going to see the comet in this thing using the Newtonian um, uh, theory, right? That was seen by many people as the last coffin in the nail of Descartes' vortex theory, and that you just couldn't take Descartes seriously anymore because look at the things you can do with Newtonian theory. Now everybody was still debating about how should we think of it? Is it is gravity really an essential property of matter? Is it still some kind of fluid? Is there is it can we give a, a mechanical school explanation of gravity? Right, but the fact that that the gravitational theory of Newton's uh, gave allowed uh, 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 scientists to make these incredible predictions. Uh, I think was was the catalyst that made him want to um, to do the, 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 the this work, the new uh, the mathematical foundations, and to do it in such a way that it seemed um, you know it, 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 that that it that it also upheld some of the things that Newton talked about, like absolute space, right? So he's going to say, oh yeah, we could you know I'm going to use the term absolute space, but but you know if you look at my definition, it's really relational space, right? I mean that that why would somebody do something like that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really wild. And, it, and the only thing I can think of is that there was a certain, you know, power of those ideas. They really were gaining hold. Um, although not everybody still accepted absolute space. But I mean, it is a weird, um, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned at one point um, that it was a cynical use of the term absolute space. And I remember some uh, sort of people, that it, editors and stuff said, that's too harsh a term. But it is kind of cynical, right? I mean, he knows that, that his conception of absolute space is not absolute space the way Newton understood it, right? He knows that it's upholding his own versions of relational motion in his earlier work when he rejected absolute space and stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting historical, I think, note in itself. Itself, right, is Kant's attempt to keep the framings of Newtonian science, but really give you a Huygensian, um, Leibnizian kind of view. I don't know if I'm if I'm helping you, uh, Marion, at, at all. Is that help, helpful? Yeah, no, this is so helpful. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm kind of taking away, and then you can correct me if I'm still not understanding your view, um, is that you you see the the main contrast to Decides, decides saying, um, the Newtonian influence in Kant like sparks a revolution in his thinking uh, in like deep and profound ways. And you are saying instead the like broad and perhaps foundational framework of his thinking remains the same. Yeah. He's true to his roots. Yeah. Um, and in response to the wide acceptance of Newtonianism and its its own just um, perhaps merits on itself, not just its popularity, uh, he wants to find ways to incorporate it within the project he's already doing. But it's this yeah. um, incorporation rather than a revolution. OK, yeah. that, that does it. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. He's incorporating the successes that Newtonian theory uh, is, is increasingly get, getting, right? Especially in the second half of the of the uh, of the 18th century, uh, it's really really becoming a successful theory and doing all this great work. And I, I think he feels well. I really need to bring this in, and especially the, the view of gravity into a conception. But it upholds his sort of committed relationism in that regard. Um, you know, in that sense, um, you know, but the other things I was going to mention, and, and, and Nick brought this up too, um, the things that I found fascinating, and this, this stuff is out there, right, you, if you find it, is that, you know, there is this view that Newton invented absolute and relational space. But when you read Pardis and Borelli and stuff, you're like, no, these guys have that distinction, 
they're in fact they're talking about it and they're saying Descartes doesn't get it right you know he, his his conception of motion is only relative motion it doesn't really tell us what if the bodies are how they're really moving relative to absolute space and Huygens comes around and says oh don't talk that way <laughs> you know there is no absolute space I mean you really have a well-developed uh, uh, arguments between a lot of the main people working in science at, you know in the 16s and 16s and 70s long before Newton comes along and that is unknown by many people who work on the absolute relational debate. Um, and, you know, and absolute relational conceptions go all the way back to the ancients, right? There's evidence in the in the in the medieval period. You see people talking about ends absolutum, ends uh, uh, respectum, and things like this, right? But but it's always more metaphysical. It's more dealing with like God and stuff like this. It's not really related to mechanics. Um, in many ways, Huygens really, I think. Uh, is the guy that took this kind of vague absolute relational debate, which was somewhat theological, somewhat just basically superficial and visual, and made it a central issue in mechanics, right? Which is, you know, which is how relationism has survived to this day, right? It's, you know, can we make a consistent uh, mechanical system or develop laws of physics and stuff that uphold relationism, or can't we? And Huygens really made, I mean, that, that's really one of his great achievements in, in, in terms, I mean, he really modernized the, 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 the absolute relational debate in many ways through his work. Um, and, and Newton just basically picked it up, right? Because Newton, if you look at, you know, the, the discussion of absolute relational space in the Principia, it follows exactly what, how Parties and Borelli and those guys uh, um, kind of laid it out. Um, and so he's just basically taking the right, and like I said, we know that he actually had conversations with some of these people in his earlier years. So clearly he must have uh, heard about these works or maybe even read these works. Um, some of those works went through many, um, Pardee's work and Borelli's work went through many editions. And so they, they must have been widely disseminated uh, and, on the continent and elsewhere. And so, uh, and so that, that, that was one of the things I, I found really fascinating you know, that, that there, you know, it's um, it, this, you know, against the kind of, uh, you know, the great people of science that came, came across and invented all these things out of the blue. Now, usually you find that they, they had these ideas were around and they're just kind of adding their own two cents to it. But um, anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent. No, no, that's great. And that's, um, yeah, yeah, I was really glad to have some of that, that prehistory notion. Um, if there's time for another little follow-up, I'd love to ask sure. another question. Unless, unless somebody's in the queue and, uh, uh, Edward. But I think we got. Yeah, uh, 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 Marianne, can I, you, you want to stay here, and after Elliot has asked this question, I can come back to you. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Elliot, the floor is yours. Hello. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks. This is really interesting. Um, I've been thinking about your response to Ed's question and the asymmetry between conceiving of the rotation of the universe as opposed to its um, uniform linear motion. Mm -hmm. And there are two things that have been uh, standing out to me, and I'm uh, wondering how you, uh, what you think of them, and how it fits in with your broader argument. Um, okay. So first, in the uh, remark to proposition two of the phenomenology, right? We get this statement from Kant where he says, um, moreover, in Newton's scolium to the definitions he has prefixed to his Principia may be consulted on the subject towards the end where it becomes clear that the circular motion of two bodies around a common central point, and thus also the axial rotation of the earth can still be known by experience even in empty space and thus without any empirically possible comparison within an external space. So that a motion therefore, which is a change of external relations in space can be empirically given, even though the space is not itself empirically given and is no object of experience. This is a paradox that deserves to be solved, right? So um, even with the case of the um, circular motion or the, the rotation of the entire universe, we'd have some instance of motion, which is defined right as just um, a change of external relations in space without being able to give a corresponding um, empirical space in which this motion occurs. Um, but uh, I take it with, uh, with why it is that circular motion can be actual um, is that there's, you can identify forces, right? That cause um, the inertial uh, our body moving inertially to, to deviate from its trajectory. Um, and so like, uh, th that's the one thing. Um, so you can have, it seems like there are cases of 
motion without empirical spaces that can be considered actual because you can appeal to forces that are responsible for the motion. Um, okay, and then the, the second thing, one, um, something that I found striking from Friedman's um, uh, reading of the work is that he places this emphasis on the use of the third law to identify mm -hmm. pairs of bodies that are interacting, right? Where it's like really bringing to the fore the, the idea that um, all interaction is mutual, right? Or all action is interaction. Um, so uh, you, f you find cases of collision or gravitational attraction where there are pairs of bodies acting. Um, so I wonder if there's this asymmetry between thinking of the, um, the rotation and linear um, translation of the entire universe um, because um, in the case of the rotation of the universe, but not in its linear translation, you can identify forces that um, are responsible for causing the motion um, and which would make the first um, an object of experience, but not the latter. Um, and that, that strikes me as something um, uniquely Newtonian actually, right? Like finding, um, identifying the true motions by looking um, to the forces responsible for them. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I, um, uh, uh, that, you know, there's definitely something to that. Um, the, um, you know, the, the Newton's bucket experiment, right, was, was maybe, the, maybe the rotating globes is, is the better example there because Newton even says that, that you, you can tell whether the, you know, the, the evidence there for the, the, the globes would be rotating would be the tension on the cord. And so uh, the tension on the cord could be measured then to determine actually the degree of the rotation and so, and so there is empirical evidence to show that the, the two globes separated by a, by a wire or something or a rope, right? That you, there, the, ten, the, the evidence would be there to, to say that, no, this is really rotating because of the tension or the lack of tension. Um, and so the, it, it, in that quote you were mentioning, right? It, it really shows that there's empirical evidence for rotation, whether it's the sides of the water going up the sides of the bucket or the tension on the cord. You don't have that right with the inertial motion of the world if it's moving uniformly. Of course, Clark then says in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, well, what if the motion stopped? Then you have an acceleration or a deacceleration. And wouldn't that a force effect be, be felt? And unfortunately, Leibniz died before he, he wrote his sixth letter where he where presumably or hopefully he would have had a response to that. That would have been a really, really important response because finally one of the Newtonians are saying, okay, you know, um, how about the effects of force aren't those experiential aren't there don't they therefore show that um that there's been a motion right even though it's not a motion relative to a body right that's always been the big problem there um but yeah I, and so I, I think the 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 presence of the forces right that you can actually see water going up the side of the bucket or the tension of the cord um makes the you know breaks the asymmetry between you know it, it breaks makes this case more difficult to deal with for a relationist rather than a uniform motion where there really doesn't seem to be any, any evidence, right? Whether the universe is moving five miles per hour in absolute space or is it still, you're never gonna know, uh, given, you know, due to the Galilean principle, right? That physics always stays the same in an inertial frame. Um, but in the in the rotating case, right? We do have the evidence for it. I don't know if, if, if Robert, that's, uh, or Elliot, if that's, um, if that, if that's uh, addressing the concern you were mentioning or if I'm tracking it, but that also might be the reason why um, he allows for circular motion to be possible, but not useful, whereas he really wants to reject the idea that the, the uniform motion of the world occurs at all, um, unless it, it's within that sort of framework of the center of mass frame where you put the universe on one side and the body outside the universe on the other uh, side, and therefore talk about, their, about, about uh, the, 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 um, the motion of the universe um, coming together due to gravity, right? That's the only way he, he, he'll say that you can talk about a uniform motion of the world. Maybe, maybe it's because um, these, the rotational motion issue was still such a big problem and, they, and nobody seemed to have a really good answer for how to deal with it. Um, whereas the other one, they just kind of dismissed. So, but I don't know, I don't know if, I, if, I'm, if I'm close to answering um, your response um, or your comment, um, but, um, but there is something to that definitely. All right. So, um, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Elliot. Uh, briefly. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. So the the, the brief follow up then is, um, so if the the identification of forces is the key to finding true motions, um, mm -hmm. does that tilt the the scales towards um, at least some 
Yeah, does that encourage um, a Newtonian reading of the work rather than a Leibnizian Wolfian? Um, yeah, I would. Um, um, I think he sees it as a problem to resolve um, um, through relational motion. One of the things I should mention is that he tried to give a story about how you could take straight line inertial motions and how they could possibly be turned um, in a way to allow for rotational motion that would account for the force effects, but it still would be seen as individual uh, inertial motions. This was, in, in, in Huygens tried something like this, Leibniz toyed with some ideas too. Um, I would say that they were trying to solve uh, or trying to figure out a way to explain relational motion um, in a way that wouldn't uphold absolute space. Um, and so that was a problem left to be resolved. Um, and it still is a problem, right? Even in the Bar Barbara Bertotti models, they can recapture Newtonian physics, but they have to cons they have to assume that the angular momentum of their system is zero. So, I mean, this problem has never left. I mean, this, I mean, in many ways, you know, Newton didn't invent the absolute relational debate, but he came down with the clearly the most problematic issue for relationism, which has never been resolved, right? And it's the biggest knock drop down drag out argument in the whole absolute relational debate is the rotating uh, buckets and the rotating globes thought experiment. Um, so I would say that it, it still shows that, that he was working with the Huygensian frame, right? And working within that relationist system. It's just like everybody else, they couldn't figure out an answer to it. <laughs> you know, if that's what you're asking, do, does the evidence of the rotating bucket make, maybe you're saying, does that, does that side with Kant being more Newtonian or more uh, relationist, you know, non-Newtonian? I think it still fits the non-Newtonian model because everybody's trying to figure out that problem. So, but, but it does show that rotation is a big problem for relationism and maybe relationism doesn't work for that very reason. Maybe, maybe the, um, Newton had, had his uh, finger on the problem with relationism all along and, and he's, he, he's actually indicated why it can never be successful uh, for, for really complicated systems. Systems that, have, that don't have zero angular momentum, you know, things like that, you know. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Elliot. Uh, Marianne, the floor is yours for the last question, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done for the day. All right, great. Um, I just wanted to follow up with another kind of uh, bird's eye view historical question here. Um, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more, if you've looked into this, on the role of Wolf in this, in this lineage. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think of Wolf as this like great synthesizer who draws from all sorts of places and finds ways to get things to sort of play nicely together. And so I'm curious if in this particular um, line of thinking that you're interested in um, and, and tracing the influence of Huygens especially is, is Wolf's role here largely as like handing off what you know, taking Huygens and handing it off pretty incomplete? Um, or, or is there more um, important sort of historical work done there at, at Wolf's stage to um, develop or synthesize with other ideas? That's a big part of the, the story here for Kant. That, that's a really good question. Uh, Wolf is a guy I want to get to, uh, to know more about. I, I think it is sort of in that the way you put it, that he really hands off. It's really more of the Leibnizian tradition that he hands off to Kant. Um, he does, if I recall, have a conception of relational emotion, but he probably gets it more from, from, from Leibniz. Um, so uh, his knowledge of Huygens' work or whatever, and actually the knowledge of a lot of these people of Huygens' work is unclear because Huygens was not a philosopher, right? He was really working on physical problems. And, and of course, so was Leibniz, right? And, 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 he, and, and they corresponded and, and, and all that. And so he was a big influence on, on Leibniz, but Leibniz did everything, right? He was a great scientist, great mathematician, as well as being a great philosopher and metaphysician. Um, and Wolf seems to be more in the metaphysi metaphysician camp, but all those ideas about action reaction, which you get in Leibniz, right? I mean, they're obviously in Newton's third law, but they're a central aspect of Leibnizian views. I mean, they're really in some way, a central aspect of Descartes' view as well. Right, um, that gets all kind of uh, um, taken over by Wolf, and he develops his own view, and 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 um, and and it is handed off in some sense to Kant. Kant's uh, very first work, I forget what it was called, from 1747, is straight up Leibniz Wolf monadic uh, monadology, and it's and it's an amazing work. And uh, in, in the last uh, talk I gave a couple of years ago, when I talked about spaces emergent, I, I gave a long 
I, I gave the other story about Kant and about, about his physical, the physical monadology and the other early works of him and how he sees essentially space and body as arising from uh, monads, which are non-spatial. And, uh, and, and that, that stuff I really love in Kant. That stuff is so much fun and it's written it, without the, the, the horrible language that you get in the critique, which is so fussy and so difficult. It's much more engaging and light and easy to read. Um, and, um, and, and, and so Wolf, I think he, the, his importance is that he keeps, I think a lot of Leibniz ideas and metaphysics alive and hands it off to a young Kant. And, and like I said, when you read some of that early Kant work on the, phys the, the physical monodology and the other works, um, he is one of the greatest um, Leibniz Wolfian advocates, right? We always think of Kant in the critical period, but his earlier work, I think is the best work done in the Leibniz Wolf school. Um, and it is really interesting and it has so many venues for development. Um, and, you know, when he gets to the critique, that stuff kind of falls by the wayside, although maybe in the Alpus Posthumum period, he's starting to toy with it again. Um, but that's we're late, late in life, right? And, and it's all kind of sketchy. Um, but yeah, I mean, and so, so, the, so the, the Huygens, um, um, Leibniz, Barclay, Wolf, that thread has many curves to it, <laughs> you know, because Wolf really isn't so much in the Huygens center of mass frame. And I'm not even sure if he uh, uh, necessarily developed that idea. Um, but Cott knew everything, right? He knew a lot of the work done uh, earlier and he knew about the center mass frame as it was developed by Leibniz and others. And, and so he, he probably got that more from other people outside of Wolf. But I'm not really sure. I don't know all the ins and outs of Wolf and what he really taught or what he, he did. Um, but, but, and, and I think, but, but I think that's a really area ripe for investigation is the, 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 um, the, uh, the Leibniz Wolf school. I, and I know there's a, a lot more work being done on it by Watkins and a, and a lot of other people over the last 20 years. But um, I bet you we'll find out more about Kant the more we learn about the Leibniz Wolf School, because I really think that um, um, Kant to his very last days never gave up on, on various Leibniz Wolf conceptions of the world, despite what he says in the crit critical period. And, I, and, and, the, and the evidence for it is the, is the metaphysical foundations, right? I mean, this stays true to his conception of relational motion and all that stuff that you get in the, in the, in the pre-critical works. All right, I think we, we will stop here uh, for today. Thanks, uh, Ed, for this um, excellent talk, and thanks all for the uh, lively and interesting um, q yeah, and Questions were great. Really loved them. Wonderful. And uh, we'll uh, see, hopefully, many of you on Friday at 3.30 p.m. for the talk by Matt Heber, and for the next uh, lunchtime talk next week at uh, noon. Have a, a good week all and see you soon. Bye.